uh, different uh, developments and to try to capture that best practice and spread it uh, as much as is uh, possible. But we're also conscious that ICS is, uh, are faced with quite a lot of complex and wicked issues um, that will have to be grappled with over the course of this year and indeed uh, beyond. <clears throat> Can I also remind everyone of the usual rules uh, for Zoom? Uh, keep yourselves muted whilst you're not speaking. Uh, if possible, keep your cameras on so we can see all of you. It's very depressing speaking to a blank screen, as I've found frequently uh, in recent weeks. It might just be me, but um, <laughs> if you could keep your cameras on, uh, that would be brilliant. Raise your virtual hand uh, if you want to address the meeting at any stage. Um, and um, uh, finally, can I also mention that there are, there's no media present this afternoon uh, and the meeting takes place under the usual Chatham House rules um, so that we can have a candid conversation. A non-attributed summary uh, report will be compiled uh, and circulated to attendees after the May elections and published on the website. Um, and can I also refer all of the attendees to a really excellent background briefing uh, produced by the Secretariat. I think Phil uh, in particular has done a lot of work on that. Thank you, Phil. Um, and I, I, just before I hand over to the speakers, I, I would just say that I think from my perspective, um, the reforms that we are now witnessing uh, do offer a, a very real opportunity of, of quite a significant and paradigm shift in how the NHS behaves. It doesn't mean that it will achieve uh, the, um, the outcomes that we hope for, but it at least gives us that uh, opportunity, particularly of closer working, uh, joined up working between NHS and local government, but also other significant stakeholders, uh, including third sector, but also private sector as well in a locality. And uh, the opportunity also critically to confront health inequalities, which have been persistent in our country, uh, and also to focus on the population health, health of the local population, rather than just the delivery of health services to that population. And I think therefore a, an ability, a, a potential ability to focus on those social determinants of health that we all know are more significant in determining the health of the population than the actual delivery of health services uh, is a, a very uh, welcome uh, opportunity. So I think I've said as much as I uh, need to say at this stage, and we now move on to the speakers. We've got four speakers, each of which we're going to ask to speak for 10 minutes. Um, and then we will have panel responses uh, from three different people. Um, and we'll come to that in a moment. But um, perhaps I could just start by introducing Naomi Eisenstadt, chair of the ICB in Northamptonshire. Uh, and I'll then, uh, once Naomi has done her bit, hand over to Andy, <clears throat> to do the rest of this section, if that's okay. Naomi, over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me to speak. And also just please wave your hand when I'm nine minutes in, so that I know it's time because you can never tell. So, so thank, thank you very much. Um, many of you on the call will have been at the NHS meeting at City Hall, at County Hall uh, yesterday in London. And I have to say, and Phil can back me up on this, that I did send him my notes in advance to make sure that I was on the right track. And Amanda Pritchard started with exactly my first note, which is what are we trying to fix? And what she started with, no more competition, we want collaboration. And what I started with was what are we trying to fix in terms of removal of the internal market, competition, working together. But I think what Amanda failed to say at that meeting is that the internal market created cultures and behaviors that worked against what we were trying to achieve. And it's very easy to change the structures. It's very hard to change the cultures. So 
So when I first took on the job of um, uh, the designate chair of what was then an ICS, not an ICB, um, actually, we weren't yet. We were, in, uh, we were an SDP. It always sounds like a drug to me. Anyway, uh, when I first took on the role, I thought it was about bringing together local government and health, and I didn't realize to what extent it was about bringing in the component parts of the health service itself, and that was going to be as difficult as bringing together um, health and local government. Um, I think the other thing to say in terms of changing the culture is that there was enormous learning from COVID and how and what an amazing job the NHS did on COVID. And I think that what we learned was that we can work together at speed when the task is clearly defined, everybody agrees on the task and local flexibility is allowed. And it was a very, very unusual circumstance where everybody agreed on the task. And that's why in my role as chair, I've really, really concentrated with some frustration, I have to say, which I'll describe on getting an outcomes framework that all partners will agree to so that we are clear what we're trying to achieve, not what we're trying to do for our individual organiza organizations. And the approach that we decided to take in Northamptonshire was a life cycle approach to, to outcomes which means that you think about prevention and early intervention at every stage of life, not just early years, not just childhood, but at every stage of life, there's opportunities to prevent the next downturn and encourage growth in the next stage. So our four stages are stay, start well, stay well, and age well. And for me, the key components of an outcome from framework is what does the data tell us about our locality and, and about our, our system? What does the data, the data tell us about inequalities within the system? Because if you just compare Northamptonshire to the rest of England, it doesn't look too bad. When you look at pockets in Northamptonshire, we have huge inequalities. The other thing that you need is progress on measurement proportional to the investment. And that's quite a tricky one. If it costs more to collect the data, then there's not much than, than actually trying to fix the problem. Then, so you want to make sure that the things that you're looking at for your outcomes are collected in administrative uh, fashion is already part of the data system. It's easy to do in real time. So you don't have to wait like with early years, 10 years before you know you've made a difference. So the proportional investment on collecting the data is really important. Um, residents with local, local uh, frontline staff and service users, do, do people recognize the problems that you're trying to solve and do they make sense? And I have to say that my long career tells me that government always wants people to want what they want them to want and they don't want to listen to what they actually want to want. And my great story from Sure Start on this is when, you know, when we consulted with local people, our test on whether uh, this, the local group spoke to local people was dog shit. Because if they came back from the consultation and said people wanted more health visitors and, and speech therapists, we knew they spoke to health visitors and speech therapists. But in the very poor communities we were working, people were actually most concerned about the physical environment. So indeed, that makes me really pleased about the fourth aim in terms of integrated care systems, which is it's a delight to see. I was absolutely astonished. I, I, I'm just, it's wonderful to be surprised at my age. Um, so anyway, the last thing that you need to think about in terms of uh, the outcomes is, is there anything you can do about it? Is it complete, you know, I mean, I think the most important outcome is reducing poverty and there are some things we can do, but there's a lot of things we can't do because a lot of the, the, the um, levers in, in uh, reducing poverty are at central government level, they're not at local level. There are things we can do, I wouldn't give up on it, but actually doing that thought piece about, well, is there an intervention? Can we afford the intervention? Does the intervention have a good evidence base? And it's funny about interventions and evidence space. I have great evidence that the best way to make people less poor is to give them money. But obviously I have real difficulty in, in setting policies to give them money. So um, for Northamptonshire, um, we set our outcomes against and our sort of and our framework against four collaboratives. Um, so one our four collaboratives are children and young people, elective care. Um, um, uh, integrated care across Northampton, our ICAM program, which is basically about um, frailty and mental health, learning difficulties and autism. 
And one of the things that's important in terms of tying us together as a system is that the four collaboratives are led by different bits of the system. So children and young people is led by local, local government, elective care is led by acute, integrated to care across Northamptonshire, the ICAM program is led by local government because it's so much about having places in the community and having a good social care system where you can discharge people from hospital, but it also of course prevent them from going into hospital in the first place. And mental health learning, disab learning disabilities and autism is the, the, the lead partner is um, Northamptonshire Health Healthcare Foundation Trust, our community trust. That doesn't mean that any of these lead partners do it on their own, but it means that somebody holds the ring and when I'm worried, I know, I know who to go to. Um, so um, I think in all of this, there's huge tensions to be managed. And I always say it's hard because it is not because you're stupid. So one of the issues in outcomes is if you're doing a population health approach, you actually don't go for the very, very, very most vulnerable and disadvantaged. Because if you do that, you won't shift the curve. If you do that with the people with the most complex, most difficult needs, the high cost, high harm, and invest all your money in that, you will not make differences in population health at a population uh, level. So for children and young people, one of the outcomes that our system chose ours are in draft now, so please don't, don't quote me on this because we're still arguing about them, was self-harm for, for adolescents. Northamptonshire is a terrible outlier on self-harm, but if no teenager ever cut themselves again in the next two years, it would not shift the curve on health inequalities in children and young people. It's a very difficult area to get across, but it's about shifting the curve rather than addressing the tail. Secondly, tension to be managed is the pressure of national priorities, which everyone says, well, we want a few national priorities, but I don't see it yet. What I see is more and more demand, more and more instruction from the center, more and more these are the must do's and everything else is up to you. But when you look at everything else up to you, there isn't much time or money to do it. And I think there's a natural problem in the system, which is local politicians will be judged by local priorities but senior NHS staff are judged in their career by NHS England. So the career paths actually work against working together. And we just, I think, have to be open and honest about that and not assume that we can do everything. Um, data collection for Northamptonshire has to be granular. We are in this strange position of it's very, very difficult to address inequalities and deep poverty in an otherwise very wealthy area. There's little experience of it. There's not much attention paid to it. And there isn't, it, there isn't just a sense of urgency about it. Yet our inequalities are very deep and we have deep rural, rural poverty. And rural poverty is, again, you don't shift the curve because it's much more expensive. Mm -hmm. And you have few people, but in real need. So balancing those things is really difficult. And finally, I think this is the, the, the trickiest one in terms of, how policy is made, which is data is critical, but all key partners have to have a gut feel, this is what really matters to me and the population I care about. So I, I just think that, that the notion about ideology matters is sometimes antithetical in that we want everything, everything to be data-based and evidence-based, but for people to get behind this and really believe in it, they have to believe in a gut, this is what we have to do for Northamptonshire. Thanks very much. Shall I pick up the reins, uh, Norman, uh, from, from here? That'd be brilliant. Yeah, thank you, Andy, and thank you, Naomi. Yeah, thanks so much, Naomi. That was uh, brilliant and, and has got us off to a great start. And I think you've set the scene uh, incredibly well. You're right. I think this is the best chance we'll ever have to put health inequality centre stage in our thinking. Uh, I don't think we'll ever get a, a better chance in bringing the health service and local government together. Uh, but uh, there's a big but, isn't there? And you just put your finger on it. If uh, professionals are judged by uh, NHS England requirements rather than the strength of their collaboration with place-based partners, how do we how do we uh, get get through that and get the right the right incentives in the system? So some of the issues sort of coming out here already and this is exactly the kind of territory we want to get into so without further ado because i know at uh, at half past i'm going to uh, introduce uh, next kathy elliott who is chair of our neighboring uh, icb 
in West Yorkshire. Cathy, over to you. Thank you, Andy. Thank you very much. I have to go to a school production. That's why I need to leave. That's why I need to explain. So there are other commitments in my life. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come and join you today, and I hope I can join future sessions. I'm Cathy Elliott. I'm Chair Designate for West Yorkshire's Integrated Care Board, and that's part of our integrated uh, system and part of our West Yorkshire Health and Care Partnership. And I suppose just something to share with you, my background is uh, voluntary sector, social enterprise, social economy. I'm a social policy advisor. I have a, a ministerial role with the Department of Transport. I've only worked in health for five years directly. So I'm really pleased that I'm well, someone like me is welcomed into this new world and this new era um, to be part of uh, the next stage. So I've brought some slides. I'm not cheating, but I want to, I've been asked to talk about governance. And in governance, you usually need to show a few uh, logical models um, and ways of working. But if you don't know much about West Yorkshire and our partnership, we've been established for around five years now. Uh, we particularly have had a strategic plan in place for two years. Um, we have 10 big ambitions that are informed by our five distinct places and have been brought together by our partnership board, which is a mixture of local authority leaders and chief execs, NHS leaders, uh, particularly chairs and chief execs, but including primary care and also voluntary sector. And that's held openly um, for public scrutiny. Uh, we're currently going through a refresh of our strategy at this time and lots of things have come into place or hope to interview, including how we learn from the pandemic, but also how we respond, particularly as a northern ICS um, to the levelling up agenda. Uh, and other uh, things that are going on around us as well, which includes our new Metro Mayor's plans and our uh, combined authorities plans. So I'm going to show you our governance model. Uh, I'll try not to take too much time. Steve, would you show the next one, please? Thank you. Now, if you love governance, I hope you'll love this flowchart. If you don't, don't worry, it's not going to be up for too long. Um, but particularly for us, our strategic, our strategy is set, uh, particularly by our health and wellbeing boards, uh, their local plans that then inform the overall uh, West Yorkshire strategy. Now, in some ways, this might be familiar to you or it's different, but I, my understanding is today we're here to share practice together um, and see if there is an exchange that's helpful to us all. That strategy then uh, will be delivered by new committees and uh, the Integrated Care Board, the ICB, uh, that we're putting into our, part our well established partnership. Um, and you can see there how there's a responsibility at West Yorkshire level, but in respecting places and making sure we're giving delegated authority to the places, we're having place-based committees which complement and work with existing system partnerships. So if you know West Yorkshire well, you've heard of Actors One in Bradford or Calderdale Cares on how systems across sectors, particularly NHS and local authorities are coming together. And those place-based place, place -based committees particularly um, give an opportunity for whole population population health budgets and ways of working together. And then we have your typical committees that sit with that. Um, and throughout that, we're embedding systems voices and participation where we're transforming a certain pathway or service, or we're looking overall on our ways of working. Could you show us the next slide, please? So uh, this is the old model to the new approach. And Mark Cobbins on the call today. Mark and I met for the first time yesterday, and we've met three times now in 24 hours, but we've been having this discussion today, uh, uh, particularly about how we overall work as a system and an approach. And for us, particularly in West Yorkshire, we're looking at performance development. It's not performance management. It's about mutual accountability and peer reviews. And particularly for our places, we've undertaken a place framework we've put together. They've undertaken their own peer reviews. Um, and then we've particularly brought in Audit Yorkshire, which uh, is a good governance tool, to make sure that they're on track and that we feel comfortable in delegating authority to them. And it's taking a whole place uh, approach and particularly that we're providing support, capacity building, and make sure we're providing added value. Just got two more slides left. So the next one is a, a flow chart again. And actually, Mark, we were at a session this morning. This is my upside down family tree for West Yorkshire. So we begin with place. We begin with the neighbourhoods. Lots of this has already existed for many years for us, including our provider collaboratives on the left hand side and how system leadership comes together, which are the purple boxes. But over the top there in places, we particularly have these new ICB committees linked to the existing partnership board that sets strategy, but we have that integrated care board there. 
Um, and the principle that we've agreed, particularly at our last partnership uh, board, was about how we uh, aim to have this balance, which is something you were just uh, uh, touching on earlier, Naomi, about how we have the NHS England and a, a variety of uh, 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 priorities that we need to deliver whilst we also give equal priority um, to those place ban, uh, plans and what the health and wellbeing board needs. And my last slide, um, we just go on to that, is what it's built on. And this really isn't fluffy stuff, please be assured, is our mission, values and behaviours. It's about suspending egos, it's about uh, sharing risk together, sharing power together. Um, and as a, you appreciate, as we get into partnerships, some of you have been doing this for many years, some of this is, might be new. It's the push and pull, isn't it? Um, it's the give and take of working in partnership together. And one of the examples we have recently over Christmas is that we found NHS money across our places and across our partnership to work with local authorities to increase uh, care worker wages, uh, working with local authorities to bring those wages up uh, to the living wage standard earlier than planned. And it's just one of our success stories so far, as well as lots of pathways work and a commitment that we have to greater diversity and leadership. So those are all my slides. I hope that's helpful to you. I suppose the key thing for me is around culture and the way we work together as leaders. Um, and particularly a really simple thing is that everyone wears at least two hats in our system. If you're going to work in an ecosystem, you have to do that, which comes back to that push and pull um, of how we work together and how we share risk together. So I hope it's a helpful case study for you. Uh, we always love talking about our work, so we're very happy to come back again. Um, my colleague Ian Holmes is here on the call as well. I know I've got to leave soon, but he's here if anyone's got any questions afterwards. But thanks for the opportunity again. Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks to you, uh, Cathy. And you definitely have a more important appointment, even than the Health Devolution Commission <laughs> at 4.30. So uh, we fully, fully understand. Uh, but I think you've really um, kind of helped, uh, I think, set out how this can look in practice. I love Start With Place. And I think you might hear something similar from, from Greater Manchester as well. I think, you know, there's a, there's a growing consistency here, I think, in the way we're all, we're all thinking. But starting with place, that means you're starting with partnership, aren't you? And you're kind of... Uh, prioritizing that within within the um, the system absolutely the the way the way to go but how we make sure that's rewarded in the system is, is obviously where we need to take the discussion as we go through so I'll, I'll carry on Norman and I think I'm going to hand back to you to lead the panel responses if that's okay but I've got two Richards to introduce uh, now one from my former uh, life in national <laughs> politics who steered me through some difficult financial issues that we had uh, uh, some some while ago uh, at the back end of the, the early 2000s and then um, and then another Richard from uh, from my more recent life uh, here in here in Greater Manchester but we're going to start with Richard Douglas uh, Richard who is uh, chair of South East London uh, ICB uh, who um, I think is going to focus on NHS and local government partnership but particularly with regard to financial flows which uh, we're, we're all hoping uh, Richard you'll be unpacking uh very uh, expertly for us in the next 10 minutes or so so over to you so i was i was asked to do both andy so i was asked to talk about partnership with local government and to talk about financial flows if i have the time for that because as you say i, I spent a bit of time dabbling in nhs finance so um so i have some views what i say i'm not going to pretend this is best practice what we're talking about i think from a South East London perspective, is this is our practice, this is what we're aiming to do, and this is how we're aiming to go about things. We're probably, Cathy, I guess about four years behind you in this. We are nowhere near as perfectly formed as, as my friends in West Yorkshire. As one of my chief executives who came from West Yorkshire keeps telling me on a sort of almost daily, daily basis. But if I kick off on, on the context of South East London, um, population of about Two million NHS spend of about seven billion. It depends how you count it. And both Andy and Norman were used to me saying this on things, but it's about seven seven billion. We've got six boroughs, five NHS providers, two hundred odd GP practices, and one community interest company. And interestingly, um, and quite a feature of London, within that patch, we have got three three players that definitely operate significantly beyond our patch norman's trust kings um and guys in st thomas who so have a, a reach that goes well beyond us and we don't have a, a clear 
one-to-one -one relationship between any of our places and any of our providers which brings sort of particular issues to the metropolitan area so what are we doing in working with local government our our position has been to establish a partnership of equals with a common purpose of improving the health and care of the populations we serve regardless of institutional interest and that's just where we start off on this and everything we're trying to do is built on that partnership approach not just the partnership with us, the local government which i'll talk about but also the partnership within the nhs and with the voluntary community sector how do we best think we achieve this now a bit of overlap here with kathy i think in our view getting that partnership is a combination of both hardwiring through governance and through the sort of functions you give bit to the governance structure but also trying to embed a different culture and a different way of working so we're trying to work on both those things at the same time to to reinforce each other and at the same time as we're thinking across those two dimensions we're also looking at this yet yeah, fundamentally at both a place level and an overall system level so that model we want to feel has the same underpinning principles whether it's a place or system level so start off with the, with the hard wiring element system level first we are one of the um, one of the ICSs that will have at the partnership level of co-chairing arrangement so I will co-chair the partnership with a lead local authority leader picked by our local authority colleagues it's a big in my view it's a big board but it probably has to be big the partnership board we've got 21 people on it we have nine of those come from local government, including all the political leaders of a nominated cabinet member. Nine come from the NHS, drawn from our chair community, not our chief exec community, and from primary care. And then on top of that, we have members from local authority side that are directed to adult social care, children's social care, and public health. So we tried at that level to get board balanced. It sort of neatly come out nine and nine plus three non-aligned people. Uh, yeah, I don't think that's absolutely necessary, but I think it feels right. It feels as though that you've got a proper balance between local government and health. Um, there's been a lot of focus over the last year or so on who's represented on the board, who the people are, um, and getting this whole concept of balance of membership. And we've been pretty clear that actually balance of membership matters diddly squat if the partnership doesn't actually do anything. And what we've then tried to focus on is, is how do we make that partnership real? How do we make that partnership have, have teeth? Um, and we've done that in a way of saying that, yeah, we'll do the integrated care strategy because that's what the legislation requires. But we've got to go well beyond that, or I don't believe my local government colleagues will bother attending after the first three to six, six months. So we're also making it very clear that that partnership will hold to account the integrated care board and other partners for delivery of that integrated care strategy. They will publicly assess our plans and whether our plans satisfy essentially four, four principles. Do the plans reflect the integrated care strategy? Are they financially viable? Are they consistent with our commitment to reduce health inequalities? And do they properly reflect local population priorities? Now, if the partnership is not happy with what we're doing on this, we are introducing you know, what we call a, a stop the clock mechanism, which is basically the partnership will be able to say to us, frankly, this is not, this is not good enough. This is not what we expect and we have to reassess. Also, the partnership will directly oversee three or four programmes. So rather than having all the, the cross-system programmes delegate to the ICB, we will look to direct leadership of the ones that the partnership has picked as priorities for them to oversee. So that's sort of the governance structure at the system level. But as you said, Andrew, most of it builds up from place level. You know, so we have a lot of discussion about the, the partnership at the system level, probably less at the local place level. And it's basically a very similar approach. Each of our places has a local care partnership bringing together 
all you know, all the NHS um, organisations, local government, community primary care partners, and the voluntary sector. I think they probably all include Health Watch as well. Um, they're all slightly different. I'll say a little bit about that in a second. Um, but our common aim on this is to delegate as much as possible to those local care partnerships which are based around our boroughs. So what we aim for is effectively total delegation of the non-hospital spend into those local care partnerships. That's what we aim, that's what we aim to do. In terms of then how they manage that and how that links with local authority money, we recognise each borough is in a very different, different place and we've not tried to build one model for everyone. We've, we've asked them to come back to us and say, what's the partnership model that works best for you? My, my chief executive describes it as sort of some of our boroughs are on the first day, some have been going out for quite a while and some are happily, happily married. And we then reflect that in the level of responsibility that's given them. So in two of them, they will bring local authority money fully into the partnership approach. In others, they will bring some in. In other areas, we're not, we're not there yet. Um, but we felt it was important to actually reflect where we were rather than rather than just trying to impose a model on everyone. So that's the sort of hard the hard wiring stuff. But I think we all agree that more importantly, more important is the cultural ways of working within these within these places. Um, and that's a lot more difficult to define and describe. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a civil servant, if you know by background, Andy, and a policy person as well as a finance person. And you like to be able to draw the lines and explain in detail. You can't on this. And I think we've got to accept that. But we do believe there are ways we can actually encourage and develop that way of working. Lots of things we're trying to do on that, but it's sim at its simplest, we're doing this in three ways. Doing almost all the stuff that we want to do through John team, not through teams that are either of the NHS or of local government, and trying to make, make that point that all have a part to play in this. So everything we're doing through joint teams. We've introduced formal development programs. Um, for example, we're working on a joint development program across our, uh, sorry, across, across our health and care professional leadership that will bring in doctors, will bring in social workers, will bring in nurses. But the development program we're trying to put together covers a lot. Um, and I guess finally, through what as leaders we've all modeled and show what we value. So that's the sort of structure we've got. Challenges and complexities, I think people have said a lot of these already. We're working within and to some extent around some very complicated legal constructs. Yeah, I don't fully understand how we're delegating some of our money to places and what arrangements we've put in place to allow some things to happen that couldn't otherwise happen, but we've done it. Um, but there are a lot of workarounds in there. I think recognising, as I said, the different parts of our ICS in different places. Comment, I think both my colleagues have, have made that there's a big risk here that NHS priorities crowd out everything else. And particularly for our executive leaders who, whose careers depend on that. And we're, we're trying to the way we approach the partnership to make, to make the partnership create a different center of gravity so that it really matters to our executive leaders how they perform against what the partnership wants, not just the NHS England line. Um, so that's it on, on the partnership side. It's two minutes basically on, on, on the money, Andy, and, and all I'm going to do is, this is, this is not about South East London, this is about maybe five, five lessons from my sort of 25, 30 years doing finance in the NHS, the five things I'm trying to bring into into the ICS. First one is don't over rely on financial incentives. They generally work for a short time on a few specific and quite simple things, but they very, very soon degrade. But do focus on removing financial disincentives, the things that block people doing the right things. So I want us to flip away from the create new incentives to remove disincentives. Second thing, give maximum possible certainty for the longest possible time. We, we kid ourselves in the NHS that we don't know how much money we're going to be spending in most places next year, the year after, the year after that. Frankly, to within fractions 
I could sit and predict what we'll be spending in each of our hospitals in three years' time, what we'll be spending in each of our mental health providers and in other areas. So why don't we give people that certainty and allow them the proper space to plan? Third lesson, I think, is, is don't be afraid to maximise delegation to people who know about delivery. So we have to adopt this maximum delegation model, whether it is to our our places for most of the out of hospital stuff or to our acute provider collaboratives for most of the in hospital stuff. I don't want to have conversations with guys, with Kings, with Lewisham about their funding streams. I don't know enough about how their hospitals work. I want them as a group of acutes to have that conversation about how you best deploy resources to deliver service change. Um, Fourth thing, maximum, maximize flexibility and minimize being fancy, but with one, with one exception, um, protect long-term investment at all costs. And that's not about protecting investment in capital kit. It's about protecting the investment in intervention and prevention, early intervention and prevention. Because you can bet your bottom dollar, if we don't, that will be crowded out by like everything else we have to do. And they're relatively small amounts to protect. You know, I sometimes think you could, I could slip through protection of this and increasing it without anyone even noticing it was compared to the budget in the hospital, it is tiny. Finally, thing, be absolutely transparent on where the money goes and why, and talk about it in human. You know, make, get to a point. I, none of our chief executives, medical directors, most of our local authority chief executives, talk about NHS finance. They haven't got a clue what our CFOs are talking about. We've got to change that because it's not CFOs that do finance, it's not them that have an impact. Um, so we've got to really change that way of working. So I mean, that was a very quick wrap through, not sure whether it answers the questions, Andy, um, and you will know that most of the lessons I've learned on finances um, are things that I never did when I was an executive myself. <laughs> and you learned it all from politicians, didn't you? Everything that you, that you know. Um, I think the phrase, I dabbled a bit in NHS finance, has got to go down as the understatement of 2022 for anybody who knows you, uh, Richard, but, but also loves you for the <laughs> things you did to help us uh, get through some of, those, some of those challenges. But no, that's terrific. Thank you. And mm. I think you made a really important point, particularly if you don't mind me saying, coming from the background that you did, where you were in a government with me where top-down control was often you know, very much <laughs> exerted. Um, the point about maximum delegation, I, I just there's a point there that everyone needs to sort of just just hold on to. I think how you develop a more empowering, bottom up trust culture through this process of change, I think, is a big prize actually if it can be if it can be taken. And I think yeah, there's lots in what you said there that's uh, really really thought provoking. So thank you very much, Richard. Uh, we'll move on to. Uh, Another Richard, Richard Lees, uh, who uh, will be known, well known to, to, uh, to, to all of you, long distinguished uh, time as leader of Manchester City Council, now uh, coming in as chair of the Greater Manchester uh, IC, ICB. Richard, I think you're going to address sort of the linkage here with the wider uh, economy, housing skills, the opportunity to um, kind of start thinking more about health in all in all policies and everything uh, that we we do as, as well I've got in my notes I hope so as well as integrating workforce uh, a bit more so over to you Richard there we go all in 10 minutes Andy if I if I can but you might be interested to know uh, that Kathy having to leave us to go to uh, uh, a, a school performance is the school performances in Ermston so I just thought I'd drop that in for you can ponder on that to uh, uh, Andy. Uh, yeah, uh, fourth speaker, and I don't think I'm going to be repeating very much of what anybody else has said, which is, uh, I think, fairly remarkable, uh, really, but th there will be some uh, re repetition. I am going to be talking very much about the uh, social determinants, the 8% plus that isn't done by health and care systems, or, or, uh, well, at least not on its own, in terms of improving uh, population health. And uh, I can tell you what the answer is. Uh, in my view, the answer is it is place-based public service uh, reform, but I'm probably going to say a little bit about how you arrive at uh, that answer. Uh, two core contentions. One, that uh, a strong economy with people of working age in good work is a prerequisite for health society. Uh, 
I think it's also the other way around as, as well. There's definitely a vice versa uh, uh, there. And I think uh, uh, you and I, Andy, were early at the, uh, earlier in the week listening to Michael Marmot and a new report from the Institute of Health Equity. And uh, in relation to good work, I think we were both struck by the phrase that's used in uh, this new report, The Business of Health Equity, which is the notion of a minimum income for healthy living, but perhaps something that's moving on a bit from the real living wage to something that uh, uh, really says something perhaps a little bit more uh, important. But strong economy is important, and I'm also uh, basing this on work being a health outcome for people of uh, working age, and uh, I think the evidence for that is very, very clear. If people lose their jobs, uh, the longer they are out of work, the more their health deteriorates, particularly their, uh, their mental health, and the harder it is to get back into work. And on average, people in work are uh, happier, more satisfied with their lives than people who aren't in uh, work. So work as a health outcome is absolutely fundamental. I'm going to read a, an extract. It's an extract from the Manchester Independent uh, Productivity Review from uh, 2019, and it's under the heading Productivity and Health, and I think it's uh, uh, fairly self-explanatory. And it says, by its nature, labour productivity measurement ignores those people of working age who are not in the formal labour market. It also effectively glosses over those whose productivity at work is constrained by physical and mental health challenges. The benefits that improvements in health can bring for productivity performance are therefore largely hidden from view in standard productivity analysis. This is despite evidence to suggest they will be significant and a major contributor to the greater sharing of the benefits of employment in areas of Greater Manchester where deindustrialization has left a legacy of ill health, particularly amongst over 50s. I'll come back to the over 50s in a little while. Uh, a recent high level review of the links between health, well being, and productivity, with a particular focus on the cities of the north of England, for example, estimated that the productivity gap between the north and the UK average will be reduced by 30%, 30% if participation in the workforce was raised by addressing ill health. It also found that working people in the north experiencing Ill, uh, a spell of ill health were 39% more likely to lose their job compared to their counterparts in the rest of the England. England. Now, clearly, that's talking about the impact on the economy, but by implication, the impact on lots of ordinary people's lives will be absolutely phenomenal if we were to get that equation between uh, health and productivity uh, right. That independent uh, uh, prosperity review uh, built on something 10 years early, the Manchester Independent Economic Review. And I am going to take us briefly uh, back to that. It was the first of its kind commissioned by Greater Manchester. It had provenance. It was launched by the then Chancellor of the Exchequer and the then Secretary of State for Communities and Local uh, uh, Government. It had a very eminent review panel chaired by Tom McKillop, who's uh, former Chief Executive of uh, AstraZeneca. It produced a phenomenally robust uh, evidence base that allowed uh, Greater Manchester to have a discussion with uh, particularly the Treasury that we've not been able to have previously. And it's an evidence base that even uh, post-2010 uh, that uh, pro-devolution politicians like Greg Clark were able to use to make their case in the coalition uh, government. Uh, what did the Independent Economic Review, was? what was it largely responsible for uh, producing? Well, what we see in uh, England now in terms of devolution, uh, in terms of metropolitan governance, probably would not have happened if it had not been for that independent uh, economic review. But it is something more important, I think, which is uh, in a very clear way, begin to set out what the causal links are between social and economic uh, policy. And that's very clear in what recommendation number one was. So uh, you get a, a group of... Uh, eminent economists, you ask them what we need to do to improve the economy of uh, Greater Manchester, uh, their first recommendation, well, if you're serious about growing your economy in the long term, you invest in early years. Um, perhaps not what we expected, but it makes clear, clear sense. I think there's lots of evidence that from minus six months to three years is probably the most important part in uh, any person's uh, development, particularly the development of uh, communications uh, skills. Uh, 
that with, within that, I think we probably ought to be giving some more attention to antenatal services that, are, that have taken a bit of a battering because that minus six uh, months bit is really, really important as well as what happens post uh, natal. We do ha really have a lack of longitudinal research in, in this area. Indeed, one of the difficulties of getting Treasury to sign up to Sure yeah. Start was that lack of con longitudinal uh, research. But I think there is enough evidence to suggest this is what we need to do. Out of that for Greater Manchester came the eight stage model. Eight stage model of how effectively we would support, uh, if necessary, intervene in, in lives of families with very young uh, children. And that eight stage approach required as a necessity working across uh, the uh, health sector, local authority sector, and with the uh, voluntary and independent sector as, as, as well. Because it start, obviously started off with uh, maternity services, uh, the first link in the chain are health workers going through to uh, early years uh, settings. And where individual local authorities have signed up for that eight stage model, they are now really beginning to see the, the benefit. And this is a report published in 2009, and we're now beginning to see the benefits because the first young people to go through that eight stage model are only now just beginning to enter uh, into high school. Uh, these are things that really do have uh, a long time before they, uh, they come into uh, 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 fruition. But those districts that have adopted this approach are seeing the benefit. We are seeing uh, massive increases in school readiness. We're seeing improvement in school performance. We're seeing improvements in outcomes for uh, young people, still below national average, but there used to be a long, long way below national average. Now the gap is very, very much uh, na narrowed. I think that started as on a journey really of public service reform, which was reinforced by the work we did around troubled, uh, troubled families. And that really got us into the balance of what we did on a, tar uh, a universal services and on targeted uh, services and told us that uh, those families that really needed the highest level of support were nearly always having multiple contacts with a range of agencies, multiple assessments, and a whole load of disconnected uh, in interventions. It's what the public service reform model wants to uh, address. It's moved to uh, asset-based approaches rather than deficit approaches, trusted assessors, so people have to tell their story once rather than having to tell it uh, over and over again. Uh, looking at whole family and a whole community approaches, not just treating everybody as an individual, but dealing with issues within their, uh, their contacts, uh, context and those people themselves being part of the design and production of the programmes that are there to support them. The, probably the best example of this approach was in the Working Well programme. It built on failure of the work programme to take that public service reform uh, approach. Those people who were furthest from the labor, uh, labor market. And that did involve wrapping around health, skills. Uh, skills devolution was a very important ask for Greater Manchester, which was only partially reached, but was really important in this uh, area, area of work. And what we found with that working well approach was the outcomes were significantly better in the hardest to reach groups of people than they've been through the national work programme. And in every district in Greater Manchester, we exceeded uh, the targets. I mentioned I come back to the over 50s. They're a real big part of this. Uh, unemployment levels in, in big chunks of Greater Manchester in over 50s, uh, in the, those people who are of uh, working age, is around 25% or greater. Of that 25%, uh, very high levels of uh, uh, low literacy, low numeracy, low, uh, low skills, uh, that vast majority of them have health problems, either mental uh, or uh, other uh, long-term limiting conditions, or uh, I think the phrase musculoskeletal problems, I think more commonly known as the bad, uh, bad back, um, quite often with all of those uh, issues, not just uh, one of those. And the point is about that public service uh, approach, it, it worked. And it was also the driver for health devolution in uh, Greater, Greater Manchester, uh, because 
health devolution was driven by local authorities, not because we wanted to run primary health, not because we wanted to run hospitals. What we wanted to do to make sure was health was properly joined up with other public services in being able to deliver that approach for those people in, in greatest need. And I do think uh, ICSs do now give us an opportunity because of the statutory basis to take what we've been trying to do on a voluntary basis to a new level. I'll just say a very quick word about housing, uh, Andy. Uh, I'm not going to spend any time on it at all, uh, because again, that uh, Manchester Independent Economic Review uh, identified housing as a pretty fundamental problem in the economic future of Greater Manchester. The issues we face are lack of supply, lack of suitable uh, uh, supply um, for actually our poorest problems, particularly uh, issues within an unregulated private sector rented uh, private sector rented uh, area area and um, we haven't got the approaches right to how we tackle tackle those and um, particularly around the supply issue that building more houses on its own is not enough we need to be building places and that means not just thinking about housing it's thinking about schools thinking about uh, uh, health service availability, transport, how people get to work, green spaces, air quality, all, all of those issues. And a key element of population health is going to be uh, either retrofitting or building uh, healthy places to live. And indeed, one of the uh, lessons from COVID is that we also need healthy places to work as well. Thanks, Andy. Thanks so so much, Richard. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. My connection seems a bit unstable, but um, yes, we can. You can. Great stuff. Uh, brilliant, Richard. Thanks very much. I've just put a link to the Marmot report you mentioned uh, in the chat uh, for for people to, to see. That concept a minimum income for healthy living it's so important. You know, we've just lived through a situation where some people who were ill at work couldn't go home because they knew they wouldn't be paid. I think my, has my line gone down? It looks like no, we can still hear you. Have we lost Andy? I think we have. He's coming back in, Norman, but I think he wanted to hand over to you anyway, so I would crack on. OK, well, I mean, for, for my part, uh, I think we've just heard four uh, really enlightened leaders um, uh, of ICBs. And it, it sort of gives me a lot of heart that um, uh, there are leaders in this uh, new system that uh, interpret their roles widely and recognise the potential opportunities here. I, I do hope that uh, these leading ICBs uh, link up and uh, ensure that they keep sharing learning because there's some fantastic uh, thinking going on in the, in the early stages of, of development. So thank you to all four speakers. And I love Richard's focus on early years and antenatal. Uh, I remember when I was chair of the Science and Technology Select Committee, we did a, a, an investigation inquiry into early years and evidence-based interventions and the children and parent service in Greater Manchester was one that we were really impressed by, supporting families where there was a risk of children experiencing adversity, abuse, neglect, uh, and so on. And, uh, and the extent to which Greater Manchester had invested long term in supporting those at risk families uh, was really impressive. Um, so now we come on to. Uh, responses to what we've heard uh, from a panel of three people uh, and first we'll hear from Mark Cubbon, uh, Chief Delivery Officer NHS England and Improvement. So we'll go straight to you Mark, uh, uh, thanks very much indeed. I think we're expecting about 10 minutes from you if that's possible. That's great, thank you very much today it's um I, I completely agree uh, it's, we've had some um four fantastic um insights i think from uh four of our leading systems and it's great to hear not only what they've had to share with us but also this is a, a really fantastic opportunity for them to come together and to share and learn some of the good practice that's already in place um 
So I just want to say a few things, if I could, uh, about the work that we've been doing to try and support uh, the evolution of ICSs. And, um, you know, I know this has been going on for a number of years, and it is something that I think we've all, you know, from throughout different parts of our career, it's something that I think one of the things we have in common is that generally is that this is something that people have been working on know it's the right thing to do it's just finding the opportunity to do it and then progressively over time uh clearing as many of the constraints that have been preventing uh integration and more effective system working so uh i think it's, it's great to have the opportunity to come and talk about that we've been trying to uh, i know or well, i hope if i somebody get some feedback on we've been trying to <clears throat> really develop a policy framework in this area that recognizes and respects the uh, range of partners that exist across system, rather than it just being an NHS entity. Now, I know even from conversations we had yesterday when we brought all of our um, chairs and uh, chief execs together, you know, there were some obvious kind of tensions, uh, you know, around all of that. But what we've been trying to do is be as permissive as possible uh, and be as flexible as possible in terms of how we've been developing the policy in this area. So we've been trying to, do it with a whole range of stakeholders and partners. This is at a national level, at a regional level, and really making sure that um, how we're describing things, um, you know, recognizes and does that respect, has that respect at the heart of it. And, I, and I'll say up front, I don't think we get it right 100% of the time, but I, I, I want to give, you know, a real commitment from us um, that we want to make sure that when we, you know, we get feedback, we hear it and we do something with it and be mindful of this is not something that you know we flick a switch with overnight but it is something that over time we need to get much much better at and i think we'll only uh, be much better at it <clears throat> um if, if we continue to work in partnership so that's what i'd just like to say as well as a, as a way of introduction <clears throat> excuse me so so look I, I won't go into you know why we've set up um ics's and you know how the what the policy areas are but i think you know the four key aims they will be familiar to all of us but you know this aim around uh, the fourth one, as we often describe it, as you know, supporting the social economic development across a geography in the way that we do. Uh, I just want to make sure that you know I personally kind of acknowledge that and also recognise the contribution of all partners and the NHS to play a role in that as well. Traditionally, I've been in the NHS for 30 years in a variety of different kind of roles, um, but you know we have been you know had the badge that you know we are interested in when patients when their patients actually are, are ill and i think we have a bigger contribution to to make across uh, a whole system to you know in the prevention agenda and in the population health agenda and that's working with all partners to make sure that the strengths from all of us have the benefit that we know it can bring to a population to actually make the improvements that we need to see so that's something I think we we've got to do. We've got to show I think what we're po what's possible in, in all of that area, and and I don't think that's just something about you know how we strategically talk about that or how we develop policy in that area. I think it's about how we work and how we behave. And I think one of the things I've found really encouraging working with um, our systems, our leaders across systems, is the real commitment to make that step change. Some people and some organizations, some partners, some parts of the country have been way ahead of this uh, and way ahead of others. And I think there's an opportunity for us to, again, continue to learn from the best and realize the opportunity that I think we now have, uh, that, the point that others have made uh, very clearly, I think, uh, earlier on. This, I think the point around strong local leadership, though, in the relationships, I, I know that we know this, we shouldn't um, underemphasize that because I think, you know, they're the whole things that I think join everyone together. It's what I've personally found over the years is a lot of it is around uh, the relationships and the trust, the recognition of the scale of challenges across a population and uh, a real commitment to actually work together to do it. And, you know, I think we do see, uh, you know, systems and areas, examples of places where, um, where there are tensions, I think there can be some, um, some real reluctance or some nervousness about stepping forward and taking some risks um, as partners. And that's something I hope over time that we can start to shift. And I think it will definitely help having, you know, more formal structures around ICS to support those kind of uh, tensions and work through them. Uh, again, from a system perspective. So again, I think there's some real possibility there that I think we should recognize. Um, the, the principle of subsidiarity, you know, we've talked a lot about that in terms of how we've been developing our policy. And it's a thing that we really matters to us. You know, we're going through 
um, across the range of our organisations as an ALB perspective, we're coming together to think about how we work better with systems and support systems and not just work in a way that's been traditional. Um, Recognising that we have um, you know, a, a regulatory role, you know, we do and other ALBs do as well, but that should be something in our back pocket and not the first thing that we bring to the table. We should be supporting, um, it, yes, from a policy perspective, but also supporting some of the improvements and enabling and facilitating in a way that perhaps we've um, had more opportunity to do in the past, but we've not managed to get there. So they're things that I think we're committing to do, but we really want to make sure that we um, um, we hold true to that ambition as well. Um, I think the, the principle of place, you know, again, we, we've been, again, I think increasingly um, clear that we are very supportive of all that. And I know there'll be further changes uh, afoot probably in terms of, you know, how the white paper um, recently released, you know, how that signals some further changes in the future. And I think I think there's a job for us all to do is just to you know continue to work together, work through some of the issues, recognise there's not a binary um, way forward with this or an on and off switch that's going to put things magically in place and you know make some of the some of the difficulties the real issues locally in terms of how arrangements work. But I think working through things systematically and you know where we can play a role in that we really want to do it to try and simplify some of those tensions if if in fact we're we're, we're the cause of some of it so again it, I, I wanted to uh, mention that today as well um i mentioned just a few other things and i'll be quick with this but i, I thought uh, naomi at the start talking about the internal market and this culture change and i completely recognize that and you know in the earlier part of my career i kind of grew up in a in a market where we did have this internal tension you know within the health service where we were competing with our neighbors just you know five or 30 miles down the road that's going to take some time to work through and i think and, and i think um i know this is what we mentioned but it's something i i think we all recognize but it is something that i think everyone's committed to have to work through now what we are doing on that front is you know i think there's a growing belief i think from all of us that actually it's not great to have you know one organization or one part of a system that does things you know splendidly well and provides you know outstanding care if you've got a neighboring organization a neighboring population that are less well served because of some differences there and i think over i, th I think we're at a point uh, where we, we we know that's not right and and where there's opportunities to share to learn of course we should be doing it but also where there's a difference in terms of you know how resources are allocated in those areas. I think we have to front up to some of those tensions. And it's not everyone who's absolutely supportive of that, but it is something that I think we believe is really important. Uh, I think the points around, you know, what does success look like for an NHS leader? Uh, I think increasingly, I think the narrative changing about this. And of course, you know, um, a number of NHS leaders, you know, I, I've only been doing this job for a, a year. I've pre previously been running uh, a, an organization, a hospital, for four years prior to that, as chief exec down the south coast, I recognise some of the tensions that people describe. But I think increasingly, you know, the way that we map talent across health and with our partners in in uh, in care, I think it's really important that we try and do that together and build opportunities to spot talent and also to create a career development in that area. Um, I personally, you know, I had an, in, in my when I had my appraisal. Um, uh, as a chief executive of acute trust it also built into that where it was an objective for me to show how our organization how the leadership team in the organization our clinicians in the organization were actually contributing to uh, the prevention agenda in our local population i think there's things like that that we can practically do that should be a core part of what we do as traditionally perceived leadership roles in the nhs so i think there's stuff like that i think we have to get on and do we're making changes to how we oversee um the ICBs and and that is to make sure to support um, our leaders in ICBs but also to make sure that we are holding true to recognizing the significant contribution that they do make and can make in in the system context and I think we need to do more more about that and uh, and again there might be some feedback that we pick up as we go through the conversation I think the principles Richard mentioned this to Richard Douglas around delegation again I think we've got a real opportunity we know uh, the new legislation will allow us to delegate things, uh, both functions and responsibilities, but also money to different parts of the system in a way that we've um, not been exactly um, easy to do in the past. And I think we need to embrace that when we know that there's, you know, systems are mature, 
uh, leaders are willing that we can delegate those things and allow that delegation to run where systems believe it's going to uh, deliver the greatest benefit. So, um, and, and if I could just mention one thing, I think Richard Lisa, it was fascinating uh, your uh, your contribution to the discussion. And I just wanted to mention, you know, we had we've been hearing in the lots this and it's just England actually over the course of the past week, but the real example of, of really working together across the system, across health and care but with all partners. And I think it was last week or week before where there was a, an event, and I think it was the largest recruitment event we've had it for healthcare assistance across um, Greater Manchester and there were 1100 healthcare support workers recruited in one day. So again, I think there's something about, you know, our future workforce, our current gaps in workforce and really making sure that we are all working together to create opportunities for the lives of those who live in our local population. So they're just some thoughts and reflections and I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Mark, that's brilliant. And an extraordinary uh, number of healthcare uh, uh, workers recruited in that Manchester initiative that you referred to, but brilliant to have your reflections from NHS England. Thank you. Uh, I'm conscious we're very tight on time and I wanna give, ensure that we have some time for uh, discussion. So over to you straight away, Councillor Rosie Sexton. I hope I've got this right, Rosie, that you're Deputy Chair of the LGA Community Wellbeing Board. Is that right? That is right. Yes, thank you very much. And thank I goodness will, for that. I, I will be brief. Um, yeah, so the LGA's Community Wellbeing Board leads the LGA policy um, on all aspects of health and care reform. And we've worked closely with the Department of Health and NHSE to shape the national policy agenda for integrated care systems. And uh, like previous speakers, we're passionate about ensuring that it has at its heart improving population health and addressing those health inequalities. Um, one of our key messages on ICSs is that they need maximum flexibility and authority in order to work work to focus on the priorities that will make the most difference to the communities um, and it's uh, it's been really heartening to hear from four ICS leaders who are taking this flexibility and using it to to focus on on what will make the most difference for their communities. Um, I want to outline two opportunities and two challenges for the ICS. Um, first the opportunities, firstly the prevention and and the what of the what uh, prevention and addressing the wider determinants of health. So ICSs have a real opportunity to change our approach to health and care. Um, we heard from Naomi about the life course approach in Northamptonshire, uh, which recognises that we need to address those social determinants for, address for individuals throughout their life. Um, and the LGA strongly supports a community-based preventative approach to health and wellbeing. And we also heard from Richard about partnership working and bringing together local government, places, communities, businesses, and the voluntary sector. And we've heard several of the speakers talking about the importance of that fourth objective of the NHS long-term plan for the NHS to maximize their contribution to the social and economic prosperity of their areas. Um, the second opportunity is for ICSs to support and enhance existing place-based partnerships. So we heard from Cathy about how West Yorkshire and Harrogate Health and Social Care Partnership are ensuring that planning, delivery and decision making happens at the most appropriate local level. And also from Richard Lees about the importance of treating people as part of and in the context of their communities. Um, the LGA strongly supports the subsidiarity principle and we want to add ICS's. We, we want ICSs to add value by focusing on strategic priorities, such as workforce planning, sharing good practice, and investing in health, social care, and population health infrastructure, rather than bypassing or duplicating what is more effectively done at place level. As Mark mentioned, we know that there are some tensions as to how this will work in practice. Um, individual ICSs are facing different challenges, depending on their configuration and working through that is is ongoing that's a work in progress i'm sure we'll come back to that on future occasions moving on to the challenges um the first challenge that's very evident to us is workforce um, and arguably this is the biggest challenge facing health social care and public health um, this ambitious ambitious reform agenda stands or falls on having a skilled confident flexible and valued workforce across health social care and public health and it's imperative that we have parity of esteem and in paying conditions between health and care workforces. Adult social care is facing an existential crisis and without it, 
all the attempts to prevent people from becoming ill and needing inpatient treatment will be stymied. The National Health and Care Le Levy is welcome, but it fails to address the immediate challenges facing adult social care. And then secondly, we've got the tension between the urgent aims and the longer term aims to improve population health. Now, given the monumental task ahead of the NHS to recover from COVID while still living with COVID, um, we've got to look at how the ICS has balanced the urgent elective care recovery, discharge planning, A&E weights, all of those things, with the longer term priorities to focus on the prevention of ill health and working with local authorities and others on addressing those wider determinants. And this goes back to something Naomi said at the beginning, where she said that uh, everything else is up to you, uh, but it's important that that work, the social determinants, don't become part of the everything else that gets squeezed out by the focus on the urgent and the pressing. Um, so the relationship between integrated care boards, which focus on NHS delivery and the integrated care partnership, whose primary role is to set the broader system wide agenda for <coughs> improving, um, <coughs> sorry, beg your pardon, for improving health and well-being outcomes. And that's, that's crucial. So we know that we can't address health inequality without addressing inequality. And again, as Naomi quite rightly pointed out, a lot of the levers for this are at national government level. Um, and our success in tackling those health inequalities and population health will depend on how well we can find ways to address those social determinants and get to the root of the problems rather than just tinkering around the edges. Um, I will leave that with you. Brilliant, Rosie. Thank you so much. Uh, fantastic contribution. And let's move straight over to Sarah Walter. Warm welcome to you, ICS Network at the NHS Confederation. Welcome. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I will keep this brief because um, I'm conscious of time. Um, thanks very much for having me. So my name is Sarah Walter. I'm the Assistant Director of the Confed's ICS Network. So we're the independent national network that represents integrated care systems across the country. And it's been fantastic, I think, today to hear from some of our members. There's clear ambition, enthusiasm. There's lots of great stuff happening. And that's replicated, I think, in all of the conversations with integrated care systems, no matter how kind of new these systems are and getting going or established, there's, there's some excellent practice, I think, across the country. Um, just a couple of, I guess, reflections from me from listening to the conversation today. Um, I think there's some, the kind of focus on place and kind of ensuring that systems and partnerships are kind of built up from that foundation of place, I think has come across really strongly. And again, that's something that we as an ICS network would really support. Again, kind of reinforcing that principle of subsidiarity. Um, we've heard a bit about delegation and kind of maximizing delegation. Um, and I think that links also to some of the conversations we've had about outcomes and really think about how do you delegate or how do systems delegate with purpose with a real clarity about what we can achieve at place level and making sense that what we're focusing on those kind of outcomes really make sense and matter at place level um, so that they're kind of really meaningful for the, for the, for the populations um, that those places are serving. I guess one of my reflections on that is, is and acknowledging one, one of the points I think that um, a previous speaker made was around places will run at different paces almost. I think, you know, we've got some places that will be more established, um, the relationships more developed, kind of real, have that kind of real ambition, enthusiasm to kind of take on that delegation sooner rather than later. Others that maybe will require a bit more support and a bit more development and time. I think for me, there's something about how do we ensure that like, we will have that variation and that kind of difference in approaches across different places. But I think there is a role for the system in making sure that that kind of variation is desirable variation, that we're not exacerbating health inequalities by seeing places that kind of develop at different rates and that we're not seeing some fall behind um, whilst others kind of accelerate on. So I think there is a role for the system in thinking about how we kind of support um, those places in a way that enables them to respond to those local kind of health needs, um, but in a way that doesn't exacerbate um, inequalities that might also exist. I think the main um, point, I guess, that I kind of focus on throughout all of this has been around kind of culture. And there's probably two elements of that maybe that was, has kind of come out today. So and again, like in the conversations that we're having and um, have had over the last six months or so, particularly with systems, there's been a lot of discussion about establishment, around government, uh, governance, around appointments, about getting the policy framework sorted, you know, all, and all of that is important architecture that's needed. 
Um, but I think there is a risk that, that that lends to a kind of lack of focus on some of those kind of cultural behavioral issues and how we make sure that that doesn't get kind of left behind so we can have like beautiful shiny governance structures and functions maps but not if we don't have the kind of accompanying behaviors and culture that's developed um then you know then none of this is really gonna um achieve what we want to achieve and i think there's two elements of that culture one is that trust culture that i think we've heard quite a lot about so if we want to maximize delegation to place we need a culture of trust um to be developed within those systems but we also need that trust culture between systems and a kind of surrounding national architecture, whether that's the relationship with NHS England, which I think Mark has kind of touched on how that's um, developing the relationship with CQC, you know, those kind of national structures need to um, need to kind of support that shift in trust culture rather than undermine. And I guess the second element of, of the kind of culture, I guess, is around that learning culture. Um, you know, again, we've heard some really fantastic practice today. It's really clear that there's lots to be learned across different systems, also within systems. You know, you kind of talk to system leaders sometimes there was stuff going on in one place that's not shared across another place even within the same system um and i'd hope that us as a as an ics network will have an important role to play in in, in kind of supporting some of that learning culture that culture of improvements um, and innovation and helping systems learn from each other and kind of develop that approach again in a way that other partners um on this call you know local government association um social enterprise uk national voices will have a really important role to play i think in all of that um, so yeah, I guess my kind of final point is, I think, um, as you say, the ICS network um, are here to support systems and all of that, really keen to collaborate and be a kind of a part of that shift in, um, in how the kind of culture moves forward. Um, but I mean, I am a natural optimist and I feel optimistic about, um, about the opportunity that we've got here. But thanks very much. Beautifully succinct, Sarah, and I'll now hand over to Andy for the next section. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Sarah. Uh, I think there's a lot of optimism coming through uh, this, uh, this discussion today, but Rosie made a key point. How do we take this opportunity uh, to uh, move decisively in the direction of, a, you know, of health promotion and prevention whilst living with COVID, tackling the, the mountain that's in front of the NHS with regard to electives and the financial challenge? And, you know, so yeah. I think that there's a bit of a real reality check as well, isn't there, in terms of how we do all of this uh, at the same same time. So, colleagues, I think we've, the richness of the discussion has been obvious, hasn't it? And I think we need more of this, don't we? ICBs coming together and kind of talking like this. Mark said it. You know, I think it's really, really valuable. And I think that's evident by the number of people on the call. I think there's an appetite for this. But obviously, because of that, we, we've kind of uh, not not left a huge amount of time for discussion. So, what I'm going to say in the ten minutes we've got. I'm going to challenge our commissioners to give me one reflection, if you like, on what you've you've heard, and anybody else who's not commented who'd like to just to throw a uh, a comment in. So, if you could raise your hands if you want to come in, Izzy, thanks very much. So let's all be disciplined so we can hear as many voices before before we uh, before we finish. But it's been fantastic. Izzy, over to you. Super super quick, and really the essential thing that comes through is it works if you work in partnership if you try to develop that strength of partnership and you talk to each other and you make that work and 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 that's my experience from the past and i i think we have to uh work hard at partnerships they don't just happen it's a bit like marriage so that's my that's my takeaway massively important it will stand or fall on the strength of these partnerships once it linda <laughs> Yes, um, I was just going to say two things really. One was I thought it was really optimistic today and that was really heartening to feel that there's going to be real progress and the wider agenda is being looked at. I was also thinking about the challenge of the focus of both the public and the politicians at the moment on the electives and recovering from COVID, as well as coping still with COVID, although the magical thinking of the government is that it's all over, which of course it is not. Um, and, and I think that's going to be really hard to maintain um, a real delivery focus on some of the things that absolutely need to be done, but also keeping in mind, not just in mind, but really working on the wider agenda we've heard up word from today. Um, so I felt really cheery, really, after today. I think that's been good. Thanks. Good therapy, hasn't it, actually? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Instead of feeling gloomy all the time. Yeah, that's good. Imelda? Uh, thank you. I, I found today really encouraging. I thought it, uh, it's the, it's, 
for me, it feels like a real maturing of the conversations that people have been having over a very long time, but it felt mature, it felt real for the in some ways for the first time I felt it really articulated very well I really like the focus on place and partnership on healthy early years healthy working life uh, healthy aging I mean just and, and understanding that all these other things about productivity and housing and uh, wages are an important part of it but focusing on what you can do but keeping that part of the conversation I thought it was really great thank you excellent thanks Imelda Jonathan Hi, yeah, I know it's really interesting discussions. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the right place for that. It's just one sort of question I was trying to get my head around from looking at some of the new legislation coming down the line, um, which gives sort of a, a new system, which means that uh, NHS trusts are given sort of a, a final sign off. Um, so they have to agree every ICB's five year plan. Um, sort of but only NHS trusts are given that right, that sort of priority position under the new legislation. And I was wondering if, if people thought that might be a problem coming down the future or if, it, if that's going to help or hinder collaboration. I don't know whether Mark could come back on that one when we, before we finish very, very quickly, but I'll, I'll keep going through, Mark, if you or if someone else is on the call could just answer Jonathan's point. I've got Laura, Susie and Peter. So Laura, to you next. Hi, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to reflect on one point that felt really pertinent to me when Naomi was speaking earlier, which was how difficult it is to set priorities. And I really valued how Naomi was so bold in her statement about if we're going to shift the curve, we need to focus on the stuff that's going to make a real impact. And I think in London, that's something we find really difficult. I think we've got an awful lot of programmes underway. Um, and it's very difficult to close programmes down once they've started. Mm -hmm. And so you end up with, instead of a list of priorities, just quite a long list. Um, and I think that's something that's going to be a real challenge for us going forward. And then secondly, in terms of those priorities, deciding which spatial level is most appropriate to deliver that particular piece of work from. And in London, we've kind of got that super system level as well at the kind of regional point, And that adds an extra dimension. But with that principle of subsidiarity in mind, reflecting that it's not just about delegating to the most local possible level, but also how do all those other spatial levels come together to support the spatial level that's gonna lead on it. And I think that's where we sometimes are still working through what our individual roles are within that, that collective and very big system that is London. Thanks, Laura. That's an important point about the level at which the responsibility rests. But I also thought, I think it was Richard who was saying, it's interesting whether local government should lead or the health service should lead on different issues. I thought that was a kind of interesting uh, con consideration as well and, and how we get the balance right within those those leadership positions. So yeah, that fantastic. Thank you. Susie, Peter. Thank you very much. Firstly, um, I thought the positivity was great um, and I think we really need it because I think in many ways, the context in which ICS is developing um, is that the economic conditions for better health are just being eroded day by day. So um, it's a very difficult, um, it's a very difficult setting. Two main points. I think we're at the sort of chaotic gardening phase of ICS development, uh, where, you know, a thousand flowers are blooming um, and we need to really focus on how we systematize the learning from different interventions. Um, and know how to allow different parts of each system to choose what's right for them. Yeah. Um, and secondly, in creating the conditions for success of ICSs, I think that there's a need to hold NHS England and the regulators like CQC to account for, for, for the practical um, impact of what they are sometimes doing to organisations and people working within systems because their actions are militating against collaboration still. Mm. I think that is such a crucial point, uh, Susie. And um, yeah, uh, how, how we, uh, I'm not sure we can answer that today, but it's certainly one this commission needs to try and uh, try and answer before we go much further forward. Uh, Peter? Um, thanks, Andy. I thought uh, Naomi's point about a reminder that there's much in the NHS culture that needs to be changed by what we're trying to do here of its own. 
uh, sat very neatly alongside some of the issues about kind of uh, delegation and getting things as, as far away as possible. Because it seems to me that if we end up with an integrated system where everyone tries to do everything or be involved in everything, um, it will very quickly block up. And the, uh, the volume that Andy and Norman know I've hidden for years about how to come up a system in six easy moves uh, will be easy to, to do, if that makes sense. So something about how we don't have to have everybody chasing everything in the integrated world and how that delegation is really backed up by trust and real clarity about what it is those governance systems need to talk about uh, and where they're going to talk about it. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh... Peter, Mark, uh, I think Richard's had a go at answering Jonathan's question in, in the chat. Um, so uh, it's the point about which are NHS bodies and which are not, I guess. Is yeah, I think, I think Richard's comments is spot on. I mean, but you know, in reality, right, I wouldn't expect um, any ICB not to be discussing this with all partners in the in the board environment and in the partnership as well. So, um, so, so that's the reason why I think it's, it says in, it's mentioned in legislation. It's because they're NHS organisations, and you know, it's NHS money being funneled to them. But I think it's, that's the only reason why. But I think it would be done. I think in practice, um, across the membership of the ICB. Can I just mention one quick thing, Andy? Though I will be very Please quick. Is this, is this point around, you know, how does the urgent, you know, how do we prevent it getting in the way of the things that we know will deliver medium and longer term benefit? It is a real issue. We've spent a lot of time talking about this very thing yesterday. And in reality, we need to do both, don't we? We do need to do both. And the amount of time we spend on doing both will probably change over a period of time. But, you know, um, at the moment where we've got, you know, quite frankly, you know, people waiting outside A&Es and ambulances for hours to get into hospitals and we've got patients waiting. You know, we talked about the real life impact of someone waiting for a hip replacement and, you know, can't go to work because they're, you know, and they try to put food on the table for their children. You know, all of those real things we, we have to wrestle with as difficult as they are. Thank you. Absolutely, Mark. Understood. And we can't uh, forget that, can we? Otherwise, we won't be being realistic about, about what's ahead of the NHS. So th thank you. Um, so... I'm just going to give Phil Hope a, a chance to comment. I'm going to go back to my co-chair, Norman, uh, and then I'll wrap up the meeting and just explain what the next meeting will be, which actually might give us a practical way of, through a particular issue, unpacking some of the, what, we've, uh, what we've discussed today. But Phil, I'll, I'll come to you uh, first. Great. Thanks very much, um, Andy. And I have to say, I thought the contributions, the discussion has been phenomenal, actually. I think we have covered a great amount of territory with a really good insights and examples. And uh, we began the Health Devolution Commission in 2019. And if you remember, things have moved along such a long way and it really does feel as though uh, it's going in the right direction, but the challenges obviously are huge. And it is gonna be the case that the immediate attention will be on those the, the crisis facing the NHS, but we're building a system for the long term and we've got to get it right. And some of the examples we've heard today really do uh, do that. Um, I do think that the focus on place, the focus on delegation and subsidiarity and needing to do that from the bottom up and build the trust that has come across from everybody who's spoken that the governance structures where you hardwire that will reflect um, those relationships as they as they grow. And I um, uh, one area we've not talked about at all is how we've talked about ICS and place. We haven't talked about place and primary care networks. And the only mention that because I've been doing some work on this and these are the bottom up. Uh, networks at the the, the lower the smallest level and how they relate to place that uh, needs to be a part of this discussion otherwise we're going to be doing something from the top down and something from the bottom up that doesn't meet in the middle and that's um, that that can't happen um the the, the, the financial um thoughts and the ways that the finances might flow that Richard gave us his five rules I thought were were really helpful I thought that was a very uh a, a simple way of thinking are we getting this right if we're doing that um and the workforce has come up uh, uh I think it was somebody from the LGA and I I do think that the workforce is a critical problem that we have to address as ICS is so it, essentially uh, I can't list all the um uh, the, the descriptions I did like the idea of desirable variation in other words, we will have variation. It's not a bad thing. That's what flexibility allows for. But there might be some variation that's undesirable and we need to know the difference. And I thought that was a very helpful kind of thought uh, really about how we take this forward. And that's something that we in the Commission are going to be trying to do. We'll take these contributions and the future um, sessions we're going to be holding to see if we can identify what best practice is so that what that 
desirable variation looks like and so that people can from learn from the best. I think we've got some terrific material already today that we can share uh, across the networks and across the organisations. So uh, I just like to end by thanking the, the speakers and the contributors because I think they've done a fantastic job, Andy. Thanks. No, absolutely, Phil. They have. The speakers, everyone who's contributed have been brilliant. And actually, so was your background paper, and I would recommend it to everybody. Thanks uh, very Thank much you. for the work you put into that. Norman? Yeah, just thanks from me as well. Uh, we've heard uh, from some great speakers and four enlightened leaders of ICBs, and I do hope that <clears throat> as we see ICBs move at variable pace around the country, that those who really interpret their role as embracing uh, population health uh, and tackling health inequalities, that they collaborate together and uh, share learning, because I think there are enormous opportunities for the leading uh, ICSs around the country to uh, really demonstrate how this can be done effectively. The other thing I'd just say, we haven't touched on the absolute continuing importance of parity between physical and mental health. Yeah. There is a significant psychological fallout from the pandemic, and it's likely to get worse because of the uh, cost of living uh, challenges that lie ahead. Uh, and uh, I think there are real opportunities for ICSs to get mental health right uh, because of the need for collaboration between third sector, local government and NHS. But we do need to, uh, government and NHS England doesn't just focus on elective recovery, but also recognises the pressures in mental health as well. Couldn't agree more, uh, Norman. And actually, if you go back to what Richard Lees was talking about, the Working Well programme in Greater Manchester, it's been very much focused on mental health and that's yeah. been uh, behind its, its success. And in some ways, parity may not capture it anymore. Mental health, yeah. good mental health comes before good physical health often, doesn't it? It's the yeah. deterioration in mental health that leads to poor physical health. So yeah, absolutely. I think the commission at some point might see whether we can encourage some of our IC, uh, ICBs to, to see if we could set that goal of at least parity or more, you know, in terms of uh, how we, we, go, we go about uh, the mental health challenge ahead of us. But thanks, uh, Norman. Thanks, everybody. Um, it's been a tremendous discussion. And I think obviously Sarah has her network uh, through the Confederation, and that's that's important place for uh, ICBs to share best practice and you know uh, look at the issues that you all face together. But I think this commission's probably coming into its own. I mean, it's done good work, and we did a great report. But it feels like from today, actually, I, I get the feeling that this is going to be a really important space, really, for local government, for LGA colleagues, and and others to come, mayors, whatever, to you know to come together and to take the broader perspective. So. I hope you feel feel the same and that it's been time well spent. And just a final comment. I think, you know, Imelda sort of talked about optimism and I think so did, uh, I think Linda did as well when we were summing up. I think I observe, and, and a few colleagues have touched on the internal market and some of the debates about that over time. It feels there's more stability and consensus in this change than we've ever had in a, in a health service change. But I hope I'm right in saying that. It does feel that there's a lot of, finally, <laughs> we're kind of getting to something that, is about collaboration, not competition, a system, not individual institutions all competing with each other. I don't know, it feels, it feels good, doesn't it? It feels better anyway. Um, it feels like it's a basis for properly, so, you know, bringing things together. So I think it's incumbent on all of us not to miss the opportunity that's in front of us to, to build on that, hopefully a cross-party consensus about uh, a rebuilt system post-pandemic. So really excellent. And, and I just would advertise the next meeting yeah. which is going to be on the 8th of June. Two hours this time you've allowed us, which is a bit, bit more generous given the uh, normality <laughs> of what we've tried to squeeze into an hour and a half today. Uh, 3.30 to 5.30. And it's going to be about the role of ICSs in, with relation to integrated care for young people with learning disabilities and autism. And I think through that specific issue, we can really unpack some of the things here, can't we? Because actually partnership is what will deliver for those kids, the strength of local partnership. And it's how do we actually then empower those local leaders to prioritise, you know, different ways of working rather than sort of jumping to targets and other, other directives. So we can test all of what we've discussed today through that issue. And I hope you can join us for that. So I think that's our, our time up, uh, everybody. Um, thanks so much for your attendance and your excellent uh, contributions. It's been a great session. And hopefully we will see you all on the, on the 8th of June. OK, thanks all. Thanks a lot, everyone.
Thanks, Thanks very much, Emily. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Bye.